Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to another Hasselblad webinar. Uh, today, we have got a special chat with Sean Conboy. Uh, Sean is a UK based architectural photographer and he's going to join us today to talk through some of his work and how he achieves some of the results. Uh, so just to present, um, just to introduce myself as the presenter, I'm Mark Whitney, I am the Hasselblad Europe, Middle East and Africa events manager. And then just before we start, uh, just to advertise next week's webinar, where my colleague Chris Coos will be going through Hasselblad sort of colour management and Hasselblad's natural colour solution technology to explain a little bit about uh, how that works and, and what it achieves. So that's uh, a week from today, the 4th of June, uh, three o'clock British summer time. So at this point, we'll bring in Sean. Good afternoon, Sean. Hi, how are you doing, Mark? You all right, mate? Yeah, very good, thank you. Yeah, how are you right. keeping in these, in these times? Uh, yeah, I'm, do, I'm doing all right. I mean, it's very strange times, very, very strange. But I'm trying to uh, make the most of the time available in many different ways, you know, spending part of my days to do with business and part of the ways to looking after the garden and stuff like that, you know, for, for mental well-being, really. But yeah, it's going all right, it's going all right. Yeah. Okay, good, good. And I suppose architectural photography um, is probably one of the genres of photography that will hopefully begin to start getting moving soon. I think you're already starting to see it moving a little bit, aren't you? Absolutely, yeah. The last uh, two weeks prior to this, I've been started shooting. Uh, yes, yeah, it's my third week of shooting back now. So each week, you know, baby steps, but yeah, I'm shooting projects. I'm on another two day project uh, Friday, Saturday, tomorrow, and the day after. So yeah, it's definitely moving in the right direction and a lot of balls moving in the air. Um, so yeah, it's all going in the right direction, but steady as steady as the uh, as the tiller, as they say. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So just to introduce you a bit more. So as I say, UK based, um, mainly architectural, but also commercial photographer. Yeah. Um, you've been a friend of the Hasselblad brand for a while and a, a loyal user. Um, so we just wanted to go through some of your work and some of the kit you use. Uh, so if we um, start by just obviously talking about the camera so you're the owner of a h6d 100 yeah um and what we're seeing here is obviously the camera itself so the h6d body with the back uh, and an h system lens um but i think what's sort of um interesting to chat to you about is that you also use it with a technical camera yeah so the same digital back uh, used on two different bodies basically so what does that achieve for you well, well, obviously, being involved primarily in architecture and interior photography, so my, and you can probably see from my age, I've been doing this a long time. So I learned photography in the era of film and mainly four by five and eight by 10 inch film. So I've always been used to having camera movements, the ability to use camera movements on a camera. So when I made the switch to digital photography, it was extremely important to carry that over to uh, digital capture as well, too. And um, in my sort of work, it's absolutely vital to have control um, over perspective, lines, you know, uh, one plane, two plane perspective, that sort of thing. OK, so we've got another view of the camera here from the front. So you use a different set of lenses on the front, do you? Absolutely. So so basically, I've got my Hasselblad H system, which I use a lot for a lot of photography. That works great. And, and with the Hasselblad H, like any regular camera, the lens and the sensor are fixed by some metal box in the middle, whether it contains a mirror or whether it houses the sensor or whatever, it's, it's fixed. So the lens designer knows that he makes an image circle the perfect size for the sensor because the lens and sensor are never going to move. When you come onto a camera like the Linoff Techno that I use, which is a which is a miniaturized version of a four by five inch camera, really, we have the ability now to shift the lens either up and down or side to side. And also, very importantly, we can shift the sensor up and down and side to side, as you can see from the illustrations here. So the first one on the left is the main sort of movement in architectural photography for to stop converging verticals on a tall building. Side shift, which we use a lot on interior photography, which we can look at when we see some of the examples. And you also get the added benefit of uh, swing and tilt where you can actually move the plane of focus to enable you to keep everything sharp throughout the image at a much wider aperture. But the main use in architectural photography is a shift. Swing and tilt's great addition, but shift is the main use. Okay, so obviously with the sort of the larger medium format sensors that Hasselbad use, um, if we go to this slide, so can you explain a little bit here about the advantage of the larger sensor using this system? Yeah, so, and this would apply to other, other sensor size as well. So this is basically the principle with a technical camera. If you can imagine, if we're looking into this interior space here, uh, we want to keep all the lines in the space parallel. 
vertical okay so the only way we can do that is to make sure that the sensor and the lines in the space are parallel to one another if we have to tilt the sensor back to look up into the space or the building we'll then get converging verticals so yeah. by keeping it straight we keep the lines straight everything's parallel and the lines are straight but obviously then your composition might be out you might have too much ground and not enough top to your picture so that's where we use shift to move the sensor into that part of the image circle that we actually want to capture the image with and as you can see here the lens can see a lot more than the image sensor which is the uh, basically the red uh, track rectangle there so you move it around i think there's another illustration that might just illustrate that mark yeah this one here is it yeah yeah here's a perfect example so we've got the sensor and the building the lines in the building and the sensor parallel so everything's nice and straight but by doing that we have now got only half a building in the picture. We've got too much ground, not enough building. But if you look at the image circle, the lens can actually see the entire building. So what we then do is move the sensor into that part of the image circle where we, we get everything, the composition we want and all the lines nice and straight. Okay, and this sort of uh, highlights it as well. Exactly, with conver this is the usual converging, the camera's tilted, so the only way we get rid of that is to get the camera parallel like I explained. And then with the larger image circle, we can shift into that part of the image. So I think there's another slide after this mark, isn't there, which might um, illustrate. Yeah. yeah. Boom. Yeah. So this is what it would look like without any movements and correction. Correct. Tilting the camera up with a wide angle lens, which sometimes can work really well. Don't get me wrong. It can sometimes work for certain images, but you need the ability to be able to control that. So if you show the next pitch, which I think will show it with a corrected shot. So there you go. Perfect. Similarly, you get. And obviously you can, do, you can do this to a certain extent in Photoshop, but what's the advantage of doing it in camera? Yes, you can do it in Photoshop, but there's massive advantages of doing it in camera. Most, the first and foremost is, is the distortion side of it. Because obviously when you do it in Photoshop, particularly with a wide angle lens, if you think about it, what Photoshop is then doing, you imagine projecting an image onto a piece of fabric. And if you twisted that fabric, so if you projected an image with converging verticals on it onto the fabric, and you could twist the fabric back in the right way, you then correct them back to vertical again in the image. But by doing that, you're distorting the image in a different way. If you do it in the camera, you don't get that issue. Plus the fact when you do it in camera, it's done in seconds. I'm sure it can be done quite quickly. In fact, I mean, I use keystone correction sometimes for long lens stuff, but it never works as well as if you capture it in camera. And you don't have to use a full Linhoff camera. You can also use a tilt shift lens if you want to do it that way or you can use a tilt shift adapter which Hasselblad make too but the yeah. beauty of a proper technical camera is you can shift you're not shifting the lens you're actually shifting the sensor which means you get a bet you don't get any optical movement optical situations going on when you're applying the movements that way so if you're doing a stitch for example let me just show my uh, lean off camera here so it has a stitching back on it so if you're doing a stitch doing it on the back it's really easy to stitch the images together because you're not moving the lens. So you've no optical things going on when you do it that way. So that's why I like to use a, a full technical camera. OK, and the next slide we've got here is is interesting because the, the what the image on the right is a painting. Um, so that's how the, yeah. the artist has seen the scene. And obviously the technical camera enables us to capture the same type of scene. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that painting on the right hand side, it's in the uh, National uh, Gallery in Edinburgh in Scotland. I think it's about 1650, late late 1600s anyway. And next to it is a sort of modern day of the same church on a technical camera. So you can see how the artist envisaged it several hundred years ago. And the way the technical camera captures it today is very, very similar in, in the way it handles the perspective. And this is a situation where if you did it in keystone correction in Photoshop with a shot like this, with a wide angle lens, you'll find you'll get a foreshortening. You'll lose some of the grandeur of that space because you're having to distort it in a different way to correct the verticals. And this is why if you can capture it in camera, it's the best way. With a longish lens, normal to long lens, keystone correction can work really well, but with wide angles, it's, it's a lot more difficult, yeah. Okay, and obviously we've mentioned the H series, um, but we also have the X camera now, the X1D, um, yeah. but it's still possible to put the X1D on the back of a technical camera, as this shows Absolutely. here with the Cambo yeah. actors. There's so does lots, that have similar, I mean, sorry, Sean, does that have similar benefits? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm using the H camera because it's totally modular and that gives me the best solution. But there are plenty of other solutions, as I said, tilt shift lenses. A lot of the mirrorless cameras, it's brilliant with the mirrorless, mirrorless cameras because one of the problems with the mirrored cameras, like a Canon or a Nikon or, or a Hasselblad H or whatever, if you've got that box in the middle with the mirror, it means the rear element is getting further and further away from the lens. 
But with a mirrorless camera, because the, the, the sensor is much closer to the throat, you can get that sensor close to the lens. So you get much more coverage from your lenses and the sensor can see the angle of the lens a lot easier. So it works really well. Yeah. OK, great. And then going back to the H series, we also have the tilt and shift adapter. Yeah. Um, so you've used one of these before as well. Absolutely. In, in fact, the, the picture of the Virgil Arab that uh, you used to present the webinar was taken on the HTS adapter. This, this, is a, this is another way, a bit, it's a bit like a tilt shift lens, but the difference here is you can use different lenses on this adapter because not only yeah. is it a mechanical adapter, but it's got optics in it. So it, it actually enlarges the image circle of the Hasselblad lenses, which allows you to put the movements in there. For me personally, I, I, I like the flexibility of a full technical camera, probably because I'm specialising in this sort of work, but for someone who's doing different types of work this system can work really really well and and optically the quality is quite amazing actually quite amazing and you do have the tilt facility with that as i said about moving the plane of focus yeah okay great so hopefully that helps to explain to everyone the sort of um the methods you're using to yeah. catch the majority of your shots so um just another example of how you've straightened up the verticals on this image here yeah, and that's a very extreme, it's a CAS tower in Manchester, a really tall building and I'm pretty close to it. And you can see you're getting some distortion going on with the way the lines, a bit like an architect's drawing. You get that same sort of feel into your imagery as you get in a lot of architect's illustrations and drawings and so forth. But it just shows the versatility of these cameras. And having used them all from a film career, when I came to digital capture, it was why it was so important for me to, to maintain that. Plus, with it being, um, if you can imagine, a techno is a bit like a mirrorless camera. So you've, you've even more advantages with wide angle lens in the lens design. So you get really high quality wide angle lenses, which is another great thing about mirrorless cameras that the lens quality, particularly with wide angles, is really good. Yeah. OK, great. And another thing I know about you is that you, when you shoot interiors, you use quite a bit of flash lighting and continuous lighting. So you've Absolutely. supplied us with this graphic here to show the difference that lighting and interior can make. Absolutely. Again, because I learned my photography in the era of four by five inch film, and particularly transparency film, we had to capture just the way it was done. Then everything had to be captured in the camera. So even though I'm totally immersed in digital capture now, I still work to the same disciplines as it is when I shot film. I like to get as much as possible right in the camera um, for lots of reasons. I think it, it, it shows the effort you're putting in when you do the shoot. And when you put light into an interior space, you're not just balancing it because you could take a series of pictures and do a, an HDR type uh, situation with a space like this. But by putting light into the space, you're also adding something to the surfaces in the space, bringing out depth and texture, colours. Mm -hmm. It really yeah. adds something to the image. And I think it's vitally important in this sort of work. And it, you know, in, in my area of photography, it, it, it sort of makes me stand out a little bit because I, I approach it in that way, really. Yeah. So having been on some workshops with you in the past, you know, I've seen you hiding sort of flashlights behind tables and pillars yeah. and yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and running cables around big rooms as well. So is that a challenge to hide the light sometimes? Absolutely. And I know, again, you could some, some photographers have a technique where they go around with one flash and light different parts of the space and then put it together later on, you know, composite it together, which is fine. If, if that works for you, that's brilliant. I'm not saying my methods are the only way or the best way, but they suit me. But again, it's because of that's the way we used to shoot it on film. I like to try and capture everything in one shot. And particularly with these large spaces, in a way, there's a lot of there's more effort goes in when you take the shot. But you've no post-production when you get back afterwards. The, the shot's done. It's just a matter of putting it in focus and doing your raw levels and, and away you go. So I, I like to spend my time and effort capturing the picture when I take it, putting a lot of effort into that side of things. And it, it's also going back to compositionally and looking for the right picture because you're using a, a large camera that's a little bit more difficult to operate. It slows down your process, makes you really think about what you're shooting, being very careful with your compositions and you control the shot. And that's the way I, I like to work with the photography. And I think the client, if, particularly if they're with you on the shoot, they're seeing the effort you're putting into the shot and it also helps to justify your fee as well, doesn't you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, okay, great. So let's move on to actually look at some of your sort of finished images. Yeah. We've used this shot to advertise the webinar. So um, this this was involved with Hasselblad, wasn't it? So there was a, a was it Absolutely. the H5D, was it? It was it was actually the H four D if I remember H four D sixty when the sixty first came out oh, yeah. and uh, yeah. Paul Waterworth that was working with Hasselblad at the time organised this shoot out in um, Dubai at the Burj Al Arab so it was a sort of relationship between this fabulous hotel and the launch of this fabulous new camera uh, and this particular shot 
uh, we actually did it as i said on the hts with the 28 mil lens um and that's why you've seen this shot really big mark haven't you? a few times the optical yeah. quality is beautiful and and the thing i love about medium format is the tonality the dynamic range and the tonality is just i mean this image again epson printers have used this a lot to promote their printers because the tone in the sky it's absolutely you've got that blue tone running through but it's absolutely beautiful so again it's a twilight shot early twilight you, i shoot quite a bit in the middle east and you get a lot of sand pollution in the air so the sun if i remember right it's just not quite set there there's still quite a bit of light as you can see or it's just just still hanging the cloud but coming through all this sand pollution dilution which is giving you this beautiful light which is just spreading across the uh, the hotel and then all the lights the, the twinkly lights on the hotel have come to work there used a very long exposure about 30 seconds so we get some nice movement in the water not too much so you don't lose the wave tone here but you get a nice yeah. feel through the space but the trick with anything like this is getting in there well in advance because remember you're often coming out of air conditioned interiors to maybe 40 degree heat outside so you've got to let your camera all acclimatize because it's gonna it's gonna mist up just get there get everything set and just wait for that perfect moment i think i think i took about eight or nine frames of this shot but this one frame was the best frame the one either side was, was still fine but they weren't quite as good as this one so it's just being patient and, and waiting for that right moment really yeah so i guess you have quite a few early mornings do you and late nights in order to get the right shots <laughs> absolutely yeah i prefer the late nights and the early mornings i do admit that but yeah i work a lot uh, early in the morning and uh, late late in the evening you get some beautiful light effects at that time of day and uh, yeah. it's very um get a lot of inspiration from the light at that time because sometimes you know an old boss of mine in london used to say you know 50 percent more effort only might improve your picture 10 percent, but that 10 percent could make mm -hmm. the difference between you you landing that next commission and so forth yeah so absolutely love yeah. it. i love photograph particularly at twilight love it yeah okay so uh this is the is this the reception area of the hotel that's right this is the shoot and this this is this is interesting because this as we arrived we arrived very early in the morning and i think it was about 7 7 a.m and we came in and the light was just perfect into reception sometimes the light's perfect for you in a lot of interior spaces you can this is pure available light the light's lovely but there's only going to be a small part of the day when the light's in the right place to make that picture work so if you're mm. seeing it, I mean, it's hard to see on the screen, but the light's coming across the carpet, bringing all the textures out, these little shafts of sunlight, beautiful. So everything was perfect. So we shot that shot when we shot it. Yeah, yeah. So just okay. timing that make that right. And this, this one's is, looking up, is it? Yeah, this is the main sort of reception area, looking right up the centre of the hotel. These are all the balcony levels of the of the rooms. It's a, it, yeah, it's a very interesting hotel to photograph, as you can see. It's very uh, unusual colour scheme, loads and loads of detail, which is again why I think Hasselblad chose to shoot there to to show off the quality of the 60 sensor at the time. Yeah, lovely to do. Nice, again, nicely. See how we've lined it all up with the with the. I, I often, uh, whenever I can, I shoot tethered to a computer, uh, and I use a lot of grids. You can use a grid in focus. So you can put the grid where you want, which really aids with your composition on these type of shots. Because again, I, I think it goes back to shooting tranny. I like to try and get the composition within the format if possible. So I know I've got the composition there. I'm a bit bit anal about that, but it's I think it's part of being an architectural photographer, really. Yeah. 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 And then this is a the sub it's like a restaurant which is under the hotel. So here we've now used quite a bit of lighting. Um, um, as in the case with a lot of shoots overseas, um, sometimes we don't always take all the lights with us. Um, again, mm. uh, the contact at Hasselblad had a contact with a photographer that aided us with access to the hotel, and he we hired some lights off him, some tungsten lights. So we put we put lights through the fish tank, bounce through the fish tank, lights in the background coming around the walls, lights in the foreground. So there's probably I don't know five or six different heads going into that shot just to balance it all up with the in interior light. Because the key thing with light in any interior space, it's balancing your photographic lights with the ambient light in the space to make it look quite natural but enhance the feeling of the surfaces like that backlight across the metal on the walls it's really bringing that to life and giving it a lot of twinkle and here again about the xy plane we've used we've we've used side shift to minimize distortion on the front table and we've used drop shift so we can look onto the top of the tables so again I'm over, nearly always using movements on both planes, both up and down and side to side at the same time, which is another reason why I like to use a, a proper technical camera, because again, a tilt shift lens will only allow shift on, on one plane, not both. Yeah. Okay, and we've had a, uh, had a question from um, Mark, actually, just going back to uh, the daylight timings. Um, yeah. So how much time do you spend actually scouting the sites before you actually take the shot? Do you visit beforehand or...? 
If possible, yeah, but a lot of times, Mark, you don't get that opportunity because particularly when you're overseas and uh, the clock's on, it's all costing money, your fees, travel, etc. But the beauty of today, I mean, with these apps now, I use SunCalc, various apps that you get. I use SunCalc, the one I use. So before I go to any project, I've researched where the light is going to be at certain times of the day. So before we get there, we can have a good idea when we're going to take that type of shot. If you've got the luxury of a recce, that's perfect. With the bird shoot, we did. We were there the first night. We weighed that shot up and actually shot it on the second night. But I can show you a project in the Bahamas a little later where I'd researched all the angles even before I got to uh, to the island in the Bahamas. Yeah. So this shot is taken in. Uh, there's two main suites in the Burj Al Arab. Um, memory serves me. I think it's about uh, five or eight thousand square feet. It's enormous. Hotel, loads of rooms. It's like a it's like a huge house. So again, we've got. Really nice uh, window light coming in from the left hand side. And you can also see it from the study right down at the back there. So we've got some lovely window light coming in. We've got some really interesting feature available light. And then we've put some lighting into the shot. You can probably see a little bit of it on the right hand side as you're looking at the image on the chair there. We've filled in. We've got a light in the study in the background filling in and some fill light going underneath to bring all the gilts and the gold leaf and the colours in the carpet out. So it's like anything, when you put light into a subject, it comes back out and it brings the colour out as well, brings the depth and the colour of what you're photographing back out. Okay, um, a, a quick question from Agniska. Um, so if it's not possible to add your own lighting, um, do you then rely on the camera's dynamic range or do you use uh, multiple exposures? Mainly use the camera's dynamic range. It's another reason I don't, I do very little compositing. It's very rare, probably, one in a one in 50 shots that we have to do a composite with a window but yeah i, I rely on the dynamic range it's another reason i'm a i mean that's why i absolutely love the 100 megapixel sensor the dynamic range of it is just outstanding and i think if you use it within with hdr you have to be clever clever you've, you've got to do it if you're going to do it blend images you need to really do it manually a lot of the programs give you some crazy effects and i know loads of clients i once saw an art director throw a hard drive out a six story window because it was full of HDR images he didn't like. You know, you, you've you got to get, and dynamic range gives you a much nicer feel, but coupled with that dynamic, dynamic range, like the picture in the reception of the Burj, it's timing. There will be certain times of day when the light will fall better in an interior space and it's making use, just like you are with the outside stuff, you're making use of that. It's like this shot here, this is a twilight shot. Now, if you know the Burj, like the big sail thing is a fabric, so there's still light coming into this space through the fabric, but now it's in twilight. So there's very little coming into the space. So then the interior light's becoming more powerful, but we've still got some fill from what's coming through this sail part of the hotel, this fabric part. Yeah. Okay, uh, a question from Douglas. So if you have um, different lighting sources, um, how do you set the white balance? Is there a particular technique you used? Yeah, very good question. Very good question, that. Uh, very perceptive. Yeah, I use a colour meter a lot, Douglas. Um, there's some great ones out there. I use the Lumo one, which plugs into your iPhone. It's an amazing colour. It even measures the colour of your flash. So I'll take the colour of the uh, of the shots, of the spaces. You tend to find, if you're lighting a space, and I use mainly flash when I light spaces, that if you're using light in the space, you can to some degree overpower the, the colours. The colours will still come through, but because your main colours coming from the light, you can overpower them. If it's a, a, a more available light shot where the colours are going to come through stronger, that's the occasionally we may do two pictures, at, uh, one, sorry, one, one image, one raw file, and make two different versions of that raw file with different colours and blend out the areas where there's a big colour change. You know, you can do that in the focus. Uh, software it works really well but there's not many occasions when you have to do that it's only extreme occasions so it's by lighting it that you're really controlling the color and space and then sometimes if we're doing a very uh, warm space like this one here this is actually lit with tungsten but if i was lighting it with flash and the ambient light was very warm i also gel my flashes up a lot so i might put a cto on my flash to make my flash match the color temperature in the space that i'm photographing which helps to blend it through too yeah so using a colour meter is really important uh, because you can measure the colour in the space and you can also measure the colour you take your flash to. Yeah. Okay, that's a good tip. So this looks like my bathroom at home. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit smaller than yours, Mark, isn't it? <laughs> it's one of the, one yeah. of the bathrooms in the hotel. Um, it's amazing. I mean, it's just, it's great fun to photograph. There's a lot going on. Yeah, there's a lot going on. So again, it's one shot. We've got 
two or three lights. I think we had about three, maybe four lights hidden in different areas, light in different parts of the space, just to uh, balance it up. But it's, yeah, it's, a, it's just one shot, yeah. Okay, amazing. So a bar area is this? Yeah, and, and that this is a great example, really, of the X, Y I said before about downshift and side shift because if you look at that photograph you can actually see we're looking into the side of the bar okay so the camera is actually over to the right as you look at the image I, my camera position is slightly over to the right but again i'm using a very wide lens using a 23 millimeter road and stock lens an amazing quality lens and um so that's equivalent to about 18 i think on um, full frame 35 mil so it's very wide so if i tilted the camera bit like photographing a tall building these lines in the shot would go really crazy so i have to get the line with the camera and the lines in the space parallel which i do and then i use side shift to get the correct composition but if you look i'm also looking into the top of the glass top of the bar which is showing these lovely reflections so i've got a slightly high viewpoint and i'm shifting down not up this time shifting down to look into the bar so again movement on x and y planes both being used at the same time this one, the available light was beautiful in this space. You had a little reflector in the front. That was all. It was a really nice little space. So, okay. And then I believe of... these shots were a second visit. This is from here on. Yeah, it's really interesting. I did the first shoot for Hasselblad, and then a few years later, this is probably about two two years ago, I think. Now I went back. A Bergeler had put a, um, a big pool deck at the back of the hotel because it didn't have a very big uh, swimming pool area. And um, this is one of my clients based in Scandinavia. I do a lot of work for Kudos Design, and they designed uh, this pool deck area. It was all manufactured with cruise ship technology in Finland, and then it was floated out on barges to Dubai, and they produced piles and they assembled it all in a kit form. So it was a uh, really interesting to go back to the hotel and photograph another different part of the hotel for a different client. So here, this was I think we did this about May time. It was really hot, so we're doing a lot of very early mornings and this is these are taken very early morning not long after sunrise or even just before sunrise because the sun rises behind the uh, berg there and just making use of that beautiful light beautiful tones and again this is this is one of the things i love about my Hasselblad and it's the medium format it's the, it's the color feel the lovely soft color tones you can get through your shots really nice okay and some nice color in this one yeah, this is a this is a, somebody asked about dynamic range before, and this is a great example of that because this picture was taken probably two to three hours after sunset, so it's well night, and that lighter blue area there in the background is actually the light pollution from Dubai in the background. It's just sheer light pollution. So again, um, and this is another good one about color temperature because what I've done here, I've exposed mainly for the the rooms, these rooms here and the stairs in the foreground, and I've set my color temperature roughly to neutralize that to make that quite a neutral white and by doing that it's made the burge in the background go even bluer because i'm probably working at about four and a half thousand kelvin there so it's made the background even bluer and then uh, in in focus in the raw software i've opened the shadows up a bit like chris was doing in his demonstration to bring out the detail in the sky uh, and bring out those blues and yeah my, my client loved this shot he, he called it his batman shot it reminded him of batman with the colors i think but the blue and the cool work with us so he, the one thing I love about digital photography is the control of color because in film to do this on transparency would be really difficult you'd have to use filter packs which would then impact on your exposure and reciprocity it was really difficult but is now with digital you can capture this so easily and and uh, and this is taking the raw focus software and you can tweak the colors to your heart's content yeah yeah okay so we'll just go to another question um question from Peter um, I think this goes back to the bathroom shot that we saw, but do you have to use tilt to avoid sometimes seeing yourself in mirrors? Yeah, absolutely. Shift, yeah, shift. Yeah, shift. It shifted up. But yeah, do that quite often. Yeah. Yeah. This is another good trick you can do. You can just get the camera out of alignment in the mirror and then shift across to get the composition correct. So very, very perceptive question that. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. OK, great. And so this, uh, next image. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, we're back. We're still on that same shoot. The birds. You can see how large it's in a massive area. The infinity pool, uh, swimming pools behind, a health spa underneath. Just an amazing, all built in kit form. It's absolutely amazing. So again, this is a sunset type shot. This is the infinity pool at the front. So again, we're you can see how we're working again early in the morning, late in the evening, capturing this beautiful light, the reflections in the sky, stillness in the water. Yeah, it works really good, okay. but very hot. <laughs> yeah. Same sort of trick again. Uh, this is taken, obviously, whereas the Batman picture was taken two or three hours of sunset. This is not not too long after sunset. There's still a bit of blue and there's a bit of daylight in the sky. So we set the color temperature for the interior space and let the blue increase in the sky. Yeah. Okay. And another one of the infinity pool. 
that's it. Just yeah, just after sunset, just running out. I love these sort of very simple shots. They sort of uh, appeal to me quite a lot. I do quite a bit of this, and and again, it works. It works very well. This sort of my main client here, the the lady who owns the company. She's very aesthetic. She's got great aesthetics and stuff like this can really appeal to her, as well as shots of a major part of the project. Just the feel you can capture in stuff like this can work really well. So a shot like this, do you see this yourself, or is it is it something that's requested by the client? This sort of shot wouldn't be probably requested by the client. I mean, it's a very good point that Mark, because I'm very lucky. I get to I work on some advertising shoots with art directors, and we're working to very sort of strict plans of how we're approaching things. You get a lot of direction in shoots like that. But my clients like this, my interior designers, hospitality clients, architects, they give you a much more free hand. They look at your book, like your style, and then ask you to photograph it in your way. So I'll. Even when I'm working on the art director, I'll always shoot some stuff that appeals appeals to me, I suppose. And often it works with the clients. I mean, at worst, they're not going to use it, but nearly every time they'll use something from these. Give them some, always give them something extra. That's what I feel anyway. It's very important. Yeah. Okay. You, you take pictures because you want to, you like them, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah definitely. definitely. And this is um, going down in the staircase, uh, down to the spa below. So there's this lovely green glass detail here. And again, you can see. This is a, a great shot with dynamic range. This is an available light shot. All these shots we've looked at around here with more or less available light, just lovely light coming through the space. But again, it's timing. It's so the guy talked about wrecking before. So when we're there early in the morning or in the middle of the day when it's too hot, do your wrecking, weigh your pictures up. You see an image, and you think, God, that's, that's going to be a really good image, but it's not the right time of day to shoot it now. The best time is going to be such and such a time and working that out in advance because. Believe you and me, I've made all the mistakes of dashing in and taking maybe a nice composition, but not with the light in the right place. So just slow down, think about what you're doing. A smaller number of high quality photographs is far more valuable to the client than a whole, uh, an enormous amount of average photographs, you know. So I, I don't supply loads of pictures to the client, but what I supply, I hope, is, is going to be valuable to them. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, to squeeze in a question from Miska, um, what do you do on a shoot if the weather? doesn't cooperate um so for example if you did travel out to a location and the weather was very you know overcast or whatever are you do you have ways of getting around that absolutely brilliant question and spot on because it, again, very so a lot of these questions are very perceptive yeah it, it, it does happen sometimes and that that's why i shoot more interiors and exteriors i'll be brutally honest with you because it gives you more option twilight and early morning photography gets you out of trouble loads of times i mean this is a very early morning shot literally sun, the sun has only probably just risen when this shot you can see the way it's coming across the sky so trying to make the most of those times but yeah we will try and do as much research as we can about weather before we get there obviously if you go into places like the middle east and, 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 and the bahamas and stuff you get more good weather but occasionally it does happen and occasionally i have had to dig in and wait a day or two extra i've had some difficult calls with clients most times they'll work with you but sometimes you have to dig in and wait for that weather. And if I had to do that and wave my fee for a day or two, I would do it to get the picture out. Because what I've learned in my career is clients remember pictures. They don't remember the fact it wasn't quite light on that day. And the client says, why don't you go ahead and make the best of it? They never remember that. They just remember the picture. So you've got to try and get the picture right. But it's very difficult. I really appreciate how difficult it can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this next set of images, um, for those that, um, don't know that well or maybe those that aren't from the UK as well you live quite near um, a town called Blackpool in the northwest yeah. of the UK yeah. and it's known as being um, sort of quite a, a traditional seaside town yeah uh, you do quite a lot of work in your local community I, I do I, I'm a Blackpool lad born and bred I'm what's known as a sand grown I mean I live probably about 15 miles away from back from the countryside now but I'm a Blackpool lad born and bred my mother God bless her. She's 97. Uh, she's in a care home in Blackpool. So she's still in Blackpool. Um, I love Blackpool. And it was one time the busy. I think it was nearly the busiest holiday resort in the world at one time. Incredibly busy place. And in its boom time. And this is this is the Grand Theatre in Blackpool. You have some there's some amazing architecture in Blackpool. This is the Grand Theatre, which is a charity. And you know, Mark, you've been here. We've done a workshop here. And mm. I love to support the Grand Theatre. I absolutely adore photographing Matcham architecture. It's very challenging. I mean, these sort of spaces have not got particularly good available light in them so you've really got to like them to get the best out of them so it's absolutely love photographing stuff like this so it's 
you know, I don't make as much money out of doing this part of it, but it's all about putting something back in and and and, and enjoying that side of things. And it's helped me secure more work in many, in many many ways. You know, it's been it's been a very positive experience with any show. And this is the Tower Ballroom, same architect. Uh, this was Luke Jerome, the famous artist. He he put the moon in it, which I think we've got a picture of a bit later. And then he put the Earth in last year. That's the moon, yeah. So if we just flick back to that Earth one, because when we shot the Earth, the moon was still it didn't move. Well, it moved a little bit of wobble. But the earth rotated so we had to light it to freeze the moon with the flash so it was a particularly difficult shoot to do quite technically challenge um, but we managed to put enough flash on it to freeze it because we had to use some ambience probably a three four second exposure but there's also a lot of flash going into the space so there's probably seven or eight lights going into a into a shot like that yeah yeah okay and this is what i was sort of referenced to earlier with um you know having to put lights all around a quite a big space so i guess you've got lights plugged in all to all different sockets around the room well, well the, the beauty now with lighting is it's battery i mean i'm a as you know i'm a broncler and a broncler ambassador i use broncler flash and uh, i use mainly their move kits which is battery powered studio flash it's just with these lithium batteries now it's just incredible you've got so much power battery power and this has made a massive difference to everything so most of my shoots now, I've got enough battery powered. I think I can access about 12 battery powered heads, and that covers most shoots. Plus the efficiency, I use the para, you know, the para reflectors of a big spaces. They can be brilliant. I know they use a lot for beauty and fashion photography, but they can be really useful in light and big spaces. Uh, like this is the moon here. This was a, a slightly easier shoot because it was only it was only a little bit of air movement on the on the moon, so it was easier to keep it still. But we've obviously, there's some lovely light on the moon. We put a bit more light on it, but we've also lit all the tower ballroom behind the moon. That's all lit because we've got to make that part of the hero. This was a front cover of the Blackpool Guide, I think, last year. So we've got to make that a bit of a hero too. So it, it comes through. So it's important to light the space, particularly with these sort of Edwardian spaces. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll just squeeze in a couple more questions. So Andy. Yeah. Uh, has asked, do you focus using live view on your digital back or do you use the ground glass on the camera? Great question. Since I went to the 100, I use live view all the time. It's absolutely brilliant now with live view on the 100. When, with the previous chips, the CCDs like the 60 and the 50 and the 39 and the 22 I used before, we used to use a ground glass screen. And best will in the world, you always had to be tethered because you just to check that focus because it was difficult focusing you remember you only got a five or four centimeter image area very difficult but now with the live view on the 100 it's so easy you can actually do it on the back screen mainly use the back screen of the camera and you've also got focus peaking so nine times 99 out of 100 you can nail it on the back screen so yeah i don't use ground glass at all now i also one of the things i absolutely love is focus mobile i know you've done some uh, talks about this focus mobile one so i have an ipad pro uh, and then I'll connect from the camera to the iPad Pro so I can use live view on the iPad Pro as well and check my focus that way. So I, if I'm in a busy city centre now and there's a lot going on, in the past it would be difficult sometimes with your laptop on the floor and the cable, but now I can do it via the iPad. So, yeah, they, it's brilliant on the 100, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Okay. And also from Brian, how many images would you typically shoot in one day? Great, good question. If you're shooting stuff like the Tower Ballroom, very involved shots like that, um, we might only do six, seven pictures in a day. Um, if we're shooting outdoors with mainly available light, like some of the other stuff, we might shoot, I don't know, 20, 30 pictures a day. It, it, it's hard to say, Brian. It's the complexity of the shot that's involved in the shot, which is why I've always sort of charged my time out as per day, because you could have something like the Tower Ballroom to set the first shot, it might take three or four hours. but what I do is when I'm doing something very complicated lighting setup, I will um, plan out the shots I'm going to do. So I always spend the first half hour to hour looking at what I'm photographing when I get there, figuring out where the best shots are and then do a bit of a lighting plan, sometimes in my head, sometimes on a pad, but more in my head. So I know if I set a shot with a lot of complicated lights, when I go to my second view, I might only have to move a couple of lights to get that shot. So think of your work your lighting plan around your compositions, not your compositions around your lighting plan. Otherwise you can move all your lights and have to move them all back to the same space, if that makes sense, yeah. So again, planning, taking your time, bit of planning can save you an enormous amount of time. Yeah, enormous amount of time. Okay, and we're just looking at a couple more here from Blackpool, so the Pleasure Beach roller coaster. Yeah, this is really interesting because this is actually, uh, 
this is a, a project for Left Coast, which is an arts community putting something art back into Blackpool. They're a really good organisation, Left Coast. And this was Paint the Town. And an artist came up with these colours, uh, which referenced to various people's experiences. It sounds a really interesting story. And the Pleasure Beach allowed them to paint this boulevard area of Blackpool in these colours. So the colours were important. And, and it, obviously it was a nice sort of one plane perspective sort of shot, really, you know, all lined up nicely in the sort of drama of the roller coaster and just how the yellows pop off the blue and stuff. Yeah, it was an interesting project that, really enjoyed that project. Okay. So another and that, question. Oh, sorry, Sean. You far away, far away. From Chris. Um, yeah. So he's asking, how much does shooting medium format affect um, the clients that you shoot for? Do they value the higher image quality? Absolutely. Very is a, another. Our questions are brilliant. Thank you for asking these questions because it's things you want to talk about. Um, absolutely, it's really important because, I mean, I like shooting medium format. I like the, I like working with quality imagery, and it's important for this work for me as a photographer. I love that. But for the client, it's important too. And and one of the things that and I actually sort of sell this in, particularly with my overseas stuff. If you're going to go a long way around the world to photograph something. You're going to go to all the expense, not only my fees, the travel expenses, the interruption to the business. It's very important to then capture those images on the best possible image quality. Now, it might be when you're talking about the shoot, the client says, well, it's never going to, any, going to go any bigger than A3 or A4 or whatever. But I, I did a shoot once. It was, a, it was only I was told it was going to be A4. And in the end, they were so happy with the pictures. They wrapped buildings in them at Media City when they were building Media City, which was never considered when we were shooting them. So to have the best file quality, I think, is really, really important. And for me, the thing about medium form, it's not just the file size and the quality, it's the dynamic range and the way it handles color. You know, the true, I mean, you guys understand this better than me, but this 16 bit color, how they get out of the 14 bit now with the uh, with the 100, it's the color, the depth of the color and everything is is beautiful. Um, and clients do value it, they really do. Yeah, it does, it, 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 it. I'm not saying you wouldn't take a, a better picture because it's medium format, but if you're going to go to all this trouble, why not capture it with the best possible quality you can? That's what makes all the difference. And once you've got used to that dynamic range of medium format, I, I only shoot. I, I'll be honest. I only shoot with my um, um, with my medium format camera. I don't. I don't shoot with any smaller cameras. It's a bit. It's a bit I watched Tom last week, and he said it's about keeping clients, and I think that was a very way, good way of putting it. You know, it's, yeah. it's satisfying. It's very important. Yeah, I, I find it's very important. Yeah, and I know um, I've seen your printed portfolio as well. So obviously the the qualities of the images you think uh, they come out better in a printed medium absolutely i am absolutely passionate about that i i i, I um I, I mean i lost two contracts well uh, in, in my time when i've done presentations and both of them i did electronically it was the biggest mistake i've ever made whereas if i go in with the printed product you need to show if i'm showing off the quality particular sort of shot side there's a lot of detail in the pictures so i have a very large print with the, the images open out to about 20 by 30 inches it's really uh, graphic studio make the books for me they're fantastic quality books but it's really important to show the printed image and the quality across to the client to let the client understand the quality that can be achieved and electronically it's, it's difficult to do that so I, I, I so believe in, in some ways you could say an image, isn't a, a, an image isn't a pitch till it's printed, some people say, and I, you know, I can see that. I, I love print. I absolutely love print. Yeah, it's very important. Very important way to sell your work. Yeah. Okay, good advice. So um, moving on to some shots. This is for Sunborn. Is it? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Do a lot so, of work. Uh, floating hotel, I believe. That's right. They 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 have hotels and stuff in Scandinavia, but they also came up with this concept of a floating hotel. So this is in London, um, and this one's in Gibraltar. So the idea being that you have a ship basically with no engines, and you can tow it to wherever you need a luxury 400 bedroom hotel. Yeah, really interesting. And the latest one they've done is this one in Gibraltar. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this was a case of, of just go back to the other image. This was a classic case of. Um, getting the location because this is actually a, a basically a piece of concrete that they used to tie boats to um so we got a little rowing boat rowed out to this piece of concrete and managed we had to get a rope up and climb up it was quite a job to get on it but it gave us this viewpoint of the ship the nice side of the ship and the rocket you brought in the background that image has been used time after time after time again and now that piece of concrete is gone so you can't even get that shot now so okay. um but yeah it's about finding those right viewpoints and and then if you go to all that trouble let's capture it in the best way we can yeah yeah and different angles 
yeah, another view of that was taken from the Harbour Master's office, so the roof of the office, and again, just that nice view with the rock and the way the clouds swirl around the rock and the, just getting the colours, really, letting the yellows come through off the ship a bit stronger uh, against the blues of the uh, twilight sky. Yeah. Okay. And uh -huh. this, is, uh, this is another one about, because uh, I always say with architectural photography, you've got to get on with people and um, always be friendly and, and, and approachable because here I've climbed onto the funnel of the ship, of the floating ship, and I was sort of looking over the edge. Oh, it was quite nerve wracking dangling my camera because this is a pool at the back. And when you're actually down on it, because it's got high sides, the view's pretty awful. But by getting above in it, you can see the shape and you can see all the effort. You know, my client and I'm directing from top and we've got quite a few staff arranging all the furniture, all the towels. If you go right in all even the ice and the trays just to make it all nice and symmetrical and that early morning sun just rising above the cliff and then spilling across the shot. So thank you. Um, we've got a question from David. Um, it's, it's well, the question's mainly in relation to the Blackpool shoot, but he's asking yeah. how many are in your crew. So do you normally shoot with assistants and how many people do you have with you on a shoot? Yeah, on a Blackpool shoot, we'd, uh, we'd have normally, I'd have my, a good, well, let's call it a professional full-time assistant. And then on those ones, we'd also have a student assistant with us as well, too. Who's, so if we get, with Blackpool College, Photo College, where I went, so there's always a get approached by a lot of students. So on a situation like that, we might do one, we might sometimes even use two students. But on most shoots, it's myself and one very skilled assistant. He's not my assistant, he's not a young guy, but he's very, very skilled. He knows how, how all the flash equipment works, how it all plugs together. Um, but now I don't work with massive crews unless it's some of the advertising photography I do as, uh, then the crews can get bigger if there's a production company involved yeah okay and another question from John uh, do you get color shifting on the image when you use a lot of movement on a technical camera and if so how do you correct it it's a brilliant question absolutely yeah I should have mentioned that yeah we have to use a thing called scene calibration which is built into the focus software because you do get color shift uh, when you apply movements so we use scene calibration so basically you have a piece of perspex like uh, opaque perspex like a light box you put it in front of the lens once you've got the shot set and you've taken the exposure you're happy with everything as you finish your shot you put the perspex in increase the exposure by approximately one stop and take a picture and then when you see that that's like a map of where the color shifts going on and then in focus very quickly oh excuse me prove it's live <laughs> i'll put it on silent it came through so you see you see the color you do excuse me you see the color shift you can see the colors in that image and then you in focus you create you put it into scene calibration it puts that with your picture and it totally removes all the color shifts really really clever i think chris touched on it briefly in his presentation on on, on focus so it's very yeah. easily fixed yeah but it does happen yeah yeah okay and then you saw some of the wide shots and then also when we're doing we do you know when you're doing some of the big wide shots and we might might be waiting for that perfect moment uh when the uh light comes into the space you'll also i'll whip around with the h camera and grab some little detail shots like this which the client can use in different ways to add in with the other shots as well so i'm always shooting quite a few details close-ups little colors reflections shadows that sort of stuff great okay so the, the, this is a case in point. This is a restaurant over in, uh, this is in Turku in Finland. And um, this is very early in the morning. Again, the sun's not long after risen. So that's just available light pouring into the space. It's beautiful light early in the morning. So again, sometimes you just get the light at the right time, a bit like with the exteriors, the right time, the right place, then everything can work really, really well in the shot. And this is where the dynamic range again of the, of the 100 megapixel chip works really well. Okay. And a message from, uh, sorry, a question from Sue. Um, how do you tend to um, sort of earn your work in terms of uh, do you depend on client recommendations or do you have an agent at all? Um, no, I, I, I have been approached over the years by a number of agents, but I've never gone down that particular route. Not saying it's a, it's a good way to work and it can be very lucrative, but I'm, I've always liked to sort of be in control of my own destiny a bit, really. And um, so I've always tended to work myself. I, I do quite a bit of them i don't do as much marketing these days as i used to do um because obviously my reputation's built over the years but i've always done a, particularly in the early years did a lot of marketing went to see a lot of art directors designers clients direct hospitality architects so i'm always out there trying to 
sell my, my, my wares, let's put it that way, as, as to what it do. But an agent can do them. For I have a lot of photographer friends who have agents, and it, and it works very, very well for them. But I, particularly once my daughter came on, my daughter's 22 now, I just wanted a bit more control of my life, particularly with overseas work, so I can go when I want to go and, and just control yeah. things my way. But it, it's worked for me, yeah, it's worked very well. Okay, and I'm just flicking through some more images here. Um, yeah. So these are this is this is in the UK. This is a boutique hotel, Northcote Manor, not, not far from where I live. Actually, this is only about thirty miles away. But again, a lot of one of my old boss in London used to say, our "Interior photography is eighty percent moving furniture and twenty percent photography." Mm -hmm. And this is where the furniture's all been positioned to suit the composition and to suit the lens. Because sometimes moving a piece of furniture a foot or eighteen inches when you've got wide angle lenses can change the way that the furniture distorts and how big it feels in the image. So just positioning the furniture well is really important. And here we've got now these sort of shots, there's a lot of lighting going on. You probably see the, the wooden uh, drawers to the left of the bed. There's a light hitting that there. The corridor in the background where you can see the table light, we've repositioned all that so it suits the lens and we've put some flash down there. The lights across the bed head look like they're coming from the two reading lights, but actually we've got some flash with a, with a scrim going in down there to create that effect. So the flash is blended uh, with the light and the space. And this is a case, like the gentleman said before about color temperature, you've got the flash going in, you've got some daylight from some windows behind me. So here we've got a fairly daylight setting to the temperature and a little bit of warmth is coming out of the interior lights, which can work really, really well, yeah. Okay, and then moving on, I was actually at this shoot, so I can yeah. relate to this one. Well, this is back to our big spaces again. And this this was a fantastic shoot, Mark, wasn't it, with the York Blazers Trust at York Minster. And here, talking about the recce, we had the privilege, if you remember, I don't know if you came on the recce, but I think I went with Dave. We did a recce a couple of weeks before. So we'd figured out the time of day. I think it was about eight o'clock in the morning when we actually took the shot. Um, now, there's a lot of wood in York Minster. You can see this wooded area in the middle of the shot. and 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 if you see a lot of photographs taken, that robs a lot of light. It sucks the light up and it can appear very dark. So I knew I had to put quite a bit of flash into this part and into this part of the area. And believe it or not, that's lit with only two uh, Bronkler Power 88s with the move packs um, lighting that entire space because they allow you to spread the light so well but retain some sparkle to it. But remember, blended with the correct time on the available light coming in the back of the shot and right through the shot. So it's a careful blending of the flash and the ambient light together yeah it makes it work there okay and then another one from the york minster yeah chapter house part of the minster beautiful so we've got the camera nearly on the floor here and this is a case where uh, tethering works really well again because you can actually use the tethering to compose the picture because you can't actually get your head around the back of the camera because it's more or less on the floor so you can wire it up to the laptop and use the tethering software so you can see the image and compose it up. I've used a grid to get the symmetry right and then timing on the sunlight passing into the space. But we've also got two, the two Bronkler Power 88s positioned very carefully. So more of the flash is hitting the stone than the glazing. Just it's amazing how little movements in the position of these shapers can make a big difference to the way the light hits the subject. Mm -hmm. Just getting that rather powerful composition and shape and uh, yeah, I, I like that picture. Yeah, I like that picture. Okay, so we've got around about five minutes left of the slot. So um, we'll leave it there for the images, but if we could yeah. ask some questions. So um, there was one earlier, I, sorry, I can't quite now see who asked it, but what advice would you give to any young photographers looking to get into architectural photography? Well, I think it's, it's not easy, <laughs> I'll admit that, but I think the first thing is to get out there and take pictures. I mean, one of the great things about architectural photography is, is particularly if you're doing exterior photography, you can go out there and shoot pictures. So keep taking pictures, keep practicing. That that was always my thing. I mean, my first job, uh, when I got a job as a photographer's assistant when I left school, and, and I, it took me about an hour and a half to get to work on two buses and walking. So by the time I got home, it was winter time, I used to get home about uh, 6.30, 7 o'clock. time I'd had my tea, it was half seven. So it was night and I used to go out. That's why I always think I'm good at twilight shots. I used to go out taking photographs in the dark, more or less. But I was so keen to get out there and take photographs. And with digital photography, it's brilliant because you don't have to buy film and processing. So get out there and take as many pictures as you can. Build your portfolio and your book. Go and see people. Contact people. Look for the sort of people you might want to work with. Show them your imagery. My, my one advice when you're doing a presentation is try and do it face to face, which is something that's going to be difficult, you know, with lockdown. But it's too easy to dismiss stuff over the internet and you 
sometimes you don't get across what you what what you really is in your if you can do it face to face yeah. best way to do it okay and then a question from Brian. Um, so we've talked about your H60 and then the, the actual H60 body and then your technical camera body. So yeah. what sort of criteria, what is the decision process as to which system you would use for a shot? Well, mainly it will be for camera movements. If the shot requires camera movements, then I would have to go onto the Linhoff camera. As you, as you can see from, from the few images we've looked through, that a lot of my shots require camera movements. But if I'm doing architectural details with a longer lens or something like that, shoot it on the H. If I'm doing little details like you saw in, on the cruise, on the floating hotels, I'll use them on the H. Um, it, stuff when i'm you know i do a lot of lifestyle because sometimes when i go on an overseas shoot um, and this is what happened in the last recession we may see it again happen now they used to one time they used to send two crews a sort of an architectural operation to shoot the interiors and then maybe a fashiony lifestyle -y shoot to do the lifestyle and i found when the recession hit 2008-9 that changed a bit they wanted to do it with one crew and, and luckily for me because the architecture was a bit harder to capture technically perhaps I, you know not saying I'm a better photographer, but you know, it's a bit trickier that way. They would send me, so I'd shoot lifestyle. So I shoot a lot of lifestyle stuff on the blad. I mean, sometimes you get a shot where you don't need movements. And I use the 28 mil a lot. That's a great lens and it works really, really well. So, and also don't be frightened if you shoot in a space. And sometimes again, I do this, you shoot on a 28, but you might only need like a 35 or a mil crop on the final shot. You can often keep the camera level and crop out the bit of the image you want, a bit like, the sensors doing when it moves so there is times when you can use the h but it, it mainly revolves around the ability to use camera movements yeah okay and then uh, just to finish up is there any one building that you haven't yet photographed but would like to i get asked this question a lot and um i i, I remember getting asked it before i photographed the birds Rab some years ago and i mentioned the birds Rab, and then i got to shoot it not long afterwards so i was thinking but i'd yeah. like to put it yeah, I'd like to photograph the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. Is and I've never shot in St. Petersburg. Um, and funny enough, there is a, a client of a client that might be able to get his permission to go in there. So that may end up happening. But yeah, something like that with loads of detail in it. And also in the Vatican, some of the interior space in the Vatican, I'd love to shoot them because the detail, I, I love all that detail and the challenge of lighting that detail and, and making it look right. It's, um, yeah. I, the great i'm so lucky you know i've been into photography since i was a kid and um, a little boy and to be able to earn your living taking pictures it's i've just been so lucky well i'm sure a lot of photographers say this but every day still is exciting it's just as exciting now if not more so than when i started so yeah there's a, there's a few space i'd like to do yeah great okay so just to finish up um just wanted to remind everyone of where they can um find out some more information about you and see more of your images. So you've got yep. your uh, website, your uh, Instagram and Twitter. Yeah. And um, I don't think you'd, you'd matter too much if uh, some people wanted to reach out to you as well. You're always very helpful. Oh, absolutely. If anybody wants to send me a question, they can contact me via the website. And um, I mean, I am partially dyslexic. I'm not the fastest typer, but I'll do the best I can to get back to you. Um, but yeah, by all means, please do. I mean, it's, um, Thank you and thank you, Mark, for asking me to come on. Uh, I'm, I'm, thanks for, thanks for joining I'm, us. My whole career, and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm very proud of the brand. So it's lovely to be on here. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Sean, and uh, hopefully speak to you again soon. And hopefully we'll all return to the new normal very soon. Fingers crossed. Yeah, absolutely. And stay safe, everybody. And and thank you for taking the time to come on and listen. And see you soon. Okay. Cheers. Great. Thank you very much, Sean. Bye bye. Uh, so just to finish up, just a, a quick reminder of our webinar next week, uh, colour management. So talking about how Hasselblad um, create their, their colour spaces, um, all about that. So Thursday, the 4th of June, uh, three o'clock uh, British summertime. You can register for that on the Hasselblad website and also visit the Hasselblad website for anything that you require for product information. Uh, you can do private demo requests. Uh, see our partner network, get lots of inspiration and from lots of stories that we've got on there as well. And uh, also lots on Hasbro's history, like our involvement with the space program. So thank you very much for joining us again. And um, we hope to see you on the next webinar. Thank you.